In these services together, we're thinking about the fivefold ministry that Paul writes about in the book of Ephesians. And we'll look at that in a minute together. Um, who's the best um, detective, do you think, on TV? Who said Mr. Bean? <laughs> it's Columbo, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And Columbo, if you don't know, Peter Falk, the actor of Columbo, he's actually blind, I think, in his left eye. When he was about three years old, they discovered that he'd got cancer behind his eye, and so he had that eyeball removed, and he's never been able to see out of it for as long as he can remember. And he went for an eye test once, and um, he was there for the eye test, and he put his hand over his eye, and he read all the letters. You know how you do it? Yeah, A, E, I, E, and you get down and you start guessing. And the guy went, great, can you try your other eye, please? And he said, well, my other eye's glass. And he said, the guy doing it said, well, just try your best. Uh, this is a guy who was completely underwhelmed by his job, who was not really paying attention to what he was doing, wasn't really bothered about it, had become bored. He wasn't using his skills for God. Paul writes in Ephesians about us using the skills and gifts we've been given for God. Not just doing a random eye test that doesn't actually matter, but actually taking those talents for us. And so when we meet together like this three times a year, we pause in different ways to think, which one of them am I? Am I an apostle, a prophet, am I an evangelist, am I a pastor, or am I a teacher? We looked at apostles last time, and today we're looking at prophets. In Ephesians 4, verse 11, Paul writes these words, so Christ himself gave gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Jesus Christ. For him, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Um, I wasn't very loving to my sister when we were younger. We went on holiday to Scotland as a family. I was about 11, my sister was about nine years old, and we went on one of those boats that goes around the islands, you know, like the Isle of Skye, I think it was. And it's fine while you're near Scotland, isn't it, in that kind of crevice. But then you get out into the open sea, and it was a stormy day, and they weren't sure if the boat was going to go out, but it did. And we had lunch on board. My dad and I were the only ones in the cafeteria eating, and we had chicken broth soup. Literally, I'm not exaggerating, it slid up and down the table as we ate it. She just had to get your spoon in at the right time and eat it. Well, it was just carnage on this boat. And um, my dad said to me, Neil, don't worry. When we go outside, just look at the horizon and you won't feel sick. He said, if you look down at where the water and the boat joins, then you're really sick. So I went out and I stood next to my sister. And I said, Amanda, don't worry. Do you feel a bit sick? She said, yeah. I said, Amanda, if you look down at where the boat and the water joins, you won't feel sick. It's very naughty of me. And she, whoa, and all it, always carrots, isn't it? Even if you haven't had them for months, always there, they're just hiding away somewhere in you, aren't they, ready to be unleashed to remind you of what they're in there for. Paul says, I don't want you to be tossed around on the waves, like immature Christians that don't love each other. This passage is saturated with him saying, I want you to grow up and be mature, and you do that. The way we see it is that you are united and you love each other. It's really that simple. It's not about how many Bible verses you know, how long you've gone to church, how big your Bible is, how many harmonies you can sing. All those things are great. But are you in unity with others as much as you can be through love? That shows that you're mature. And God has given us, Paul says, these five areas that we all fit into where we can grow and mature together. Some of us are apostles who go. Some of us are prophets who speak. Some of us are evangelists who share our faith. Some of us are pastors who care. And some of us are teachers who enable others through showing them the meaning of the gospel. Just a few comments on these before we look at prophets. Firstly, I grew up and I was taught that this is only for paid leaders of churches. That it doesn't apply to you, it's for people like me. And I think that's wrong. I could be wrong, but I think it's wrong. 
because I think it's a way of keeping ministers secure in their position and their power. These are gifts for all of us, not just for leaders. All of us fit into one of these areas, I believe. And this comes before spiritual gifts. When I was growing up, I wanted to know, which gifts have I got? But actually, if you find out what ministry area you're leaning into the most, then you can work out from there, well, which of the spiritual gifts that Paul talks about link most effectively with those? Because surely they're the ones that God would want me to have so that I can serve him really effectively. And also, we're not just one area. We have one dominant area, I believe, but we have a bit of both. So if I'm an evangelist, I can't say, sorry, I don't care for you. I'm not a pastor. So although you're ill, hard luck. If you want to know about Jesus, then I'll talk to you, but otherwise, no. And if we're a pastor, we don't say when someone's saying, can you tell me the way, the truth, and life? Sorry, I can't do that. I only care for people. So there's a bit of both, but we have a dominant area. And these ministry areas are for the whole of our life. They're not just for Sunday at church. They're for when I drop the kids off at school, when I care for my grandchildren, when I'm at work, when I'm doing my hobbies, watercolour painting on a Tuesday and falling off my stool, whatever it may be. It's Monday through Sunday. Interestingly, Bible colleges through the last 300 years have focused on pastors and teachers as their leaders. We want pastors and teachers. But church history shows us that most movements have grown most effectively when apostles and evangelists have been at the forefront. In America, one denomination, they were thriving. And they said, no, you need to get them taught properly. And it began to slow down. The Methodist movement, an example from our country, we're just going out there and we're sharing the faith and we're just planting. It doesn't matter. No, no, it needs to be more organized. So we need a balance where we release the prophets and the evangelists in our churches, that they're not kind of some strange sideline, but they are front and central along with everyone else. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Two people, it makes sense to you. Brilliant, I'll take that as a majority. And the purpose is to liberate us to serve, mature and unite. Mike Breen, in a book on this, says, it's not God's idea to weigh us down with these words. God's plan is to liberate us with these words. God made each of us to serve him, but we serve in different ways ways. There was an elder at my last church and until I taught on this he said I've just felt guilty my whole Christian life. He came to faith in his 50s quite dynamically. He was a bit of a rough road before then and in our church all he did was set stuff up and then leave it and go on to something else and he said I always felt guilty because I felt like I'm not in it for the long term, that I've not got the legs to keep going with things, the commitment and he said but when I heard that that's what apostles do, that they set things up and then they hand them on to someone else, a pastor or a teacher who then develops it and deepens it, I was released but my wife's an apostle, she sets up aerobics clubs, book clubs, all these things and then hands them on to other people and releases them Having this and knowing where we fit can just lighten the load a bit. So today we look at prophets. What is a prophet? My definition is this, that they understand the times and what people should do. So they will be looking at the world news now and they will be speaking to us about what we should do. They're a questioner, which gets quite tiring, but they're always the ones saying, yeah, but what about they sometimes stand back from a situation to get a clear picture of what is happening. They spend quite a bit of time on their own if they get the chance. So while others are making plans and doing stuff, they're like, hang on a minute, let's just see what God is saying in this situation. And they hear and listen to God. What might be seen by some as lazy and inactive is actually them saying, I'm listening to what God is saying to us. They enjoy being alone with God. They absolutely love it. And that's releasing for some of us who don't enjoy being alone with God as much. You know, those of us that don't enjoy getting up at 5 a.m. and sitting in silence until 10.37 when we have one dry Weetabix before we then go back into silence until we go back to sleep. Yeah, we have our alone time with God, but some of us that really fits well and others we're more dynamic with God with other people around us and they're generally creative people musicians artists for example 
And their function is to discern the spiritual realities in a given situation and then communicate them to God's people. So they're saying, this is what I think is going on at a big picture level. And their focus is the demands of today in the light of tomorrow. So they're saying, if we don't change the way we're living now, this is what could happen. Greta Thunberg, whatever you think of her, would be a great example of a prophet to our world. If we don't change the way we're living, the planet is going to go down the toilet very, very quickly. This could happen tomorrow if we don't change what we're doing today. And their impact is that they integrate the church and the world. They're those people that are always bringing the world out there into the church, <clears throat> that are disrupting our holy huddles if we want to keep into holy huddles and say, no, no, there's a world out there and the world needs to hear from us about how much God loves them. A biblical example would be Amos from the Old Testament. When we were having our fourth child, um, Joe said to me, I wonder if we should call him, if it's a boy, Amos. And I said, I don't know. So I was going to a sporting event in North London one afternoon at 3 p.m. on a Saturday, and I decided I'd read on the train the book of Amos. And as I read it, I thought, if our fourth child is anything like this bloke, then I want to call him Amos. A shepherd from Tekoa, a small town in Judah. And he came and he prophesied in the reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam around the 8th century BC. He was a nobody, an overlooked, a non-talented, on the fringe kind of person from a world's perspective. But God said, I am going to speak through you. And he came to the kings and he strongly spoke to them of social injustice at their time and a need for them as a country to repent. You rich, powerful people, look at the people on the fringes, how they are overlooked and suppressed. You must pay attention to them. When Amos was born and I told my friend Ed Gamwells, who's not a churchgoer, that we'd called him Amos, he said, oh, I knew it would begin with A. I said, why? He said, well, amen, your children, Amos, Megan, Evie, Noah. I went, what? We didn't even plan that. <laughs> That's how holy I am, no. <laughs> Who's kidding who? Guy you see on the screen now is a modern-day prophet, Walter Brueggemann. He's an American writer. He's probably the most revered Old Testament theologian in the world at the moment. He's 91 in a few months' time, and he's written 168 books most of them about the Old Testament. He came from a poor family in America that had German roots at a time when they were not respected in America because of the time when he was born. And his dad was a pastor, but his dad was a pastor in a, a German sect of the church that was for the poor Germans, the Germans that worked in the fields that couldn't read and write that well. And so he was looked down upon. Another German pastor came to their house and he refused to stand up when Walter Brueggemann's dad came into the room because I am, you are beneath me. And so why should I stand for you? You are not a contemporary pastor with me. And so Walter grew up with this shadow over him his whole life. He didn't know what to do when he left school and he thought, well, my brother's gone to Bible college. He's a year older than me. I think I'll go to Bible college because I can't go to an English literature college because I can't write books. And so he went and he felt the call of God on his life as a nobody and became the most established person. I remember going to a preaching conference in San Antonio about five years ago and he stood up to speak in front of thousands of pastors and teachers. And he spoke truth to America and tears were pouring down my face. And I thought, why am I crying? I'm thinking, I know why I'm crying actually because the world needs to hear this. We need to hear from the prophets who will speak out on God's behalf against injustice. Here's some words he wrote. Sabbath, in the first instance, is not about worship. It is about work stoppage. It is about withdrawal from the anxiety system of Pharaoh. The refusal to let one's life be defined by production and consumption and the endless pursuit of private well-being. Well. The gospel is a very dangerous idea. We have to see how much of that dangerous idea we can perform in our own lives. There is nothing innocuous 
or safe about the gospel. Jesus did not get crucified because he was a nice man. Well, the task of the prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. What is a prophet? Simply for me, it is truth spoken to power. It is someone, a woman, a man, a teenage boy, a kid at school, who speaks truth against the powers in our culture that suppress, that overlook, that dominate, and says, no, this is wrong. God wants equality for all. And I will stand up and speak on God's behalf. Does that sound like you or someone you know?